Welcome to Megabucks Radio. Conversations with successful entrepreneurs, sharing their tips and strategies for success. Real world ideas that can put Megabucks in your bank account. Here's your host, Nina Hirschberger. Welcome to today's show. I have a very special guest on my show today. Uh, it's Dr. Michael Goldberg. Uh, he spent 47 years uh, in dentistry. Um, Michael, you're not practicing anymore, though, right? Are you prim- primarily just coaching? So I'm coaching, consulting, and teaching. But you're not a clinician anymore. Well, and, and I also see in your bio that you discovered Dean Kennedy in 1978. I thought I was the oldest one when I found him in 1994. So you go back even further. <laughs> so uh, it's an interesting story. Um, I don't know if you've even heard of Foster Hibbard. Yes, of course. So it was through Foster that I first heard about Dan Kennedy. So when I bought Foster's programs, you know, cassette tapes, <laughs> um, <laughs> Alongside, as a bonus, came this tape from a guy named Dan Kennedy. And I wore out that tape in my, in my, in my car because I played Dan so often. And then fast forward to 2006, I got the opportunity to work directly with Dan. And I jumped. What did you do with him? So Dan, I think everybody in Planet Dan knows that Dan has had some health issues. Um, And he started a program along with Charlie Martin, who who you know well, Mm -hmm. um, called Dentistry for Diabetics. And that meshed really well with my clinical philosophy of care. I always looked at the mouth as being a part of the rest of the body. And um, I joined. And we basically had a mastermind group. I mean, I've had, you know, one-on-one conversations with Dan several times. Okay, so you were still in 2006. Were you still practicing at that point? Yes, I, I didn't stop practicing until um, 2020. Wow. Okay, so in 1978, when you met Dan and you wore out that cassette tape, you obviously did something totally different in your practice that other dentists had no idea. So let's go back in time, and what was it you learned from Dan? <laughs> I'm laughing because... So I was on faculty at Columbia University. Um, At the time, it was volunteer faculty. I was teaching, actually, in the oral surgery department, um, teaching students how to give injections. And um, we had a code of ethics on the faculty. And part of that was to never um, do anything that smacked of marketing, because marketing back then was considered very unprofessional. So I learned the value of communicating with my patients. And early on, I, I formed a newsletter that I sent out to all my patients. And one day I get called to the dean's office And he has a copy of my newsletter, which was called Word of Mouth. He has a copy of it in his hand. He puts it in front of me and says, what's this? I said, it's a newsletter. He said, it's marketing. So I I didn't want to say, yes, but you don't understand marketing. I said, no, it's really not marketing because it's only going to my patients. I'm not using it to market my services to any outs, anyone outside my practice, but it's an educational tool for my patients. 
So that satisfied him. I didn't get kicked off faculty, but that was just one of the things that I learned to do early on is to use direct mail. In this case, there was no internet. It was only direct mail, um, but use it to create a stickiness to my patients and to encourage them to refer, refer others. Now, did you keep doing that print and newsletter for the entire time until you closed your practice? So I did in various forms. So I sold my practice in 2018. Um, and the practice that subsumed mine did not encourage me or actually discouraged me from continuing writing the newsletter, but I did continue blogging. So I did write a once a month blog that did go out to not only my patients, but to the entire practices patient base. Of course, they insisted on editing it and I was no longer in control having sold my practice. So some of the edits were good and some of them weren't. But what I should go back, we should go back to 2018 because the sale of my practice was something I used Dan Kennedy marketing um, knowledge to execute. Okay, so tell me about it. So I taught the practice management program at Columbia since 1984. Um, again, using some of the things that I learned from Foster and from Dan and from others, including family, because the family was in a, was in a retail and wholesale uh, business. So I did have a pre-existing business background. Um, I didn't like the idea of surrendering 10% of the purchase price for my practice to someone who really didn't really understand my practice nor give value to the purchaser. So I decided in typical Dan Kennedy fashion to use direct mail. So I, I had a fairly large prestigious practice in Midtown Manhattan. I wanted to continue practicing within that framework. Um, so I identified, I did some research and I identified 12 practices that had both the size capacity, and the quality that I was looking for. I then wrote a seven-page sales letter outlining the practice's value. Now, I should go back and say one of the things that prompted me to sell the practice was that the building that my practice was in was being demolished. So I didn't have an office to sell. All I had were, was the patient charts and me. So it wasn't a typical practice sale. So I write this seven page letter and I send it FedEx to 12 practices. All within Manhattan or someplace all, else? All in Manhattan. Okay. All within a relatively small distance in Manhattan because Manhattan is a unique kind of place. People from the east side don't go to the west side. People from the village don't go uptown. Um, it's, it, it's a unique market. So it was within what I felt would be the catchment zone for, for, my, for my particular practice. So 12, 12 of these went out. I got seven responses, 
one of whom was just somebody saying, who the heck are you? <laughs> he, he, he'd never seen anything like that and just wanted to know who I was. Um, and I got six firm offers. Six Amazing. firm offers from Amazing. that letter. And I, and one, I took one of the, I, I negotiated, um, I negotiated with three and uh, eventually took one. It's so interesting to think, though, you did that, you know, long form sales letter, you sent it to a very targeted list. And yet when they bought the practice, they, they wouldn't even do all of the things you were doing already in your practice you know, like the newsletter or something. <laughs> so the reason that they bought the practice, so I was, you know, I was still practicing and they did come to the office to see what I had done. And I had a very well oiled machine and, you know, and I'm teaching practice management, I'm coaching it. And yet you're right. They didn't, they, they adopted a couple of things but most of them were done rather half-assed and never to the extent that I had been doing it. And they, they sort of reaped the, um, the negative rewards from that, pro that process because they didn't really gain the full value. And then when I did, I had a, an employment contract for two years and I just opted at the end of two years not to renew it. Um, and they did not gain the probably the value from the practice that they could have had they continued with some of the, the uh, practices that I had, uh, you know, had before I before I sold it. You know, uh, Dan talks about, you know, uh, my my business is different. It won't work in this business. <laughs> had to be what had to be what their mindset was. Why would you not listen? So a lot of it has to do, so it's all mindset, Nina. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people are used to doing what they're doing. And to get them to change requires a mindset that there's a real need to change. And what people don't, what, what happened in my, um, in this situation is that I brought a significantly, I brought a, a large practice into an existing large practice. But the resultant larger practice was not something that they were prepared to subsume. So, we see that a lot. I see that all the time in my, in my consulting and coaching that people don't focus on building the right foundation before they start building the house on top of it. Let's explore that a little bit more. Let's stay in the dental market because I think that's interesting. Although I will say anybody listening to this, it, it applies to any business. So no business is different. But tell me what you mean about the foundation. So, you know, I'm a big fan of Vern Harnish and his scaling up program. And so I think, I think, I think it can be summed up in a sentence that I teach my students. What got you here won't get you there. And that's true of both mindset and of systems and human capital. So if you want to grow, so, you know, the, I think the typical dental practice in the United States probably grosses about $750,000 solo practice. What you, what the systems and the people that got to got you to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars might not be the same thing that you need to go from seven hundred and fifty to one point five or two million dollars. You might need to add 
or modify the systems that you have. You might need to add people or take certain people and put them on different seats on the bus using a Jim Collins good to great analogy to get you to where you want to go. But that requires changing the status quo. And most dentists, unlike most entrepreneurs, so most entrepreneurs have a mind have a have a growth mindset as opposed to a limited mindset. Most dentists go into dentistry for the safety and the security of having a profession that has a fairly consistent outcome, both in lifestyle and finances. So the urgency for them to change needs to be tweaked. Now, I know you wrote a book called From Hello to Hugs, and I was reading a little bit of the introduction, and you talk in that book about the economy changing, inflation going up, so that mindset you're just talking about, if they don't recognize there needs to be change, they probably won't stay at the 750. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's so... For for my business, the consulting consulting and coaching business, the um, pandemic was a great thing because it brought to light all the deficiencies that were present in dental practices. They those that didn't have good HR systems, those that didn't good didn't have strong financial systems. Um, those that didn't have great marketing systems faltered. And those that did were able to recover much quicker. So let's talk more about the marketing systems for those dentists. Mm -hmm. Give me some examples. So I I, like, I love the idea of making more from what you already have. And most dentists think that they need more new patients. So they employ um, marketing strategies, usually that they have to pay someone else to deploy, such as pay-per-click and SEO, um, Facebook and social media advertising, um, in order to get new patients. My focus with most of them is to develop internal marketing systems that enable them to get more from the patients they already have and to attract the kind of patients that they want. So as Dan, Dan says, none of your customers think that, it, that it's their business to send you more customers. And it's the same thing in dental practice. No patients think that it's their responsibility to send you more patients. So one of the things I learned from Charlie Martin was a process that actually spells out the expectation that patients can have from the doctor and the practice and the expectation the practice has of the patient. And one of those is, we love treating really nice people like you, and we would love for you to send three new patients just like yourself to us within the next three months. No one does that. You know, it's interesting you say that. <clears throat> I was at, uh, when Charlie was still practicing, I went to visit him, you know, years ago. And I remember, I, I have wanted since that day to remember his exact words that he used to ask for those referrals. So just what you're saying right now is absolute gold. He was a master at that. That's right. He had, he had a forum. It was called the Six Agreements. I have that forum. Um, I modified it to, I think, the Seven Agreements. Um, changing things around and adding one. 
Um, and I used it in my practice, not for everybody, but you know, Charlie had a reputation of doing what we call big case dentistry. So, I mean, he was Dan's dentist too. So he, when he would get someone like that in his practice, that's when he deployed the six agreements form. And it was written down. The patient signed it, and it was just one of those – people don't think of that as marketing, but it sure as heck is, it, and it's a system. He chose the kind of people that he wanted to get more of, and he gave those people the form to fill out so that they could refer more people like them. Yeah, I remember, you know, like when you say big cases – I mean, it wasn't unusual for him to have a $132,000 case. I mean, it, they would fly from all over the country to come to him. That's right. That's right. But And it, it didn't happen by accident, right? I mean, it's all, it's, all, it's, all, it's all trying to figure out who your avatar is. Um, just like I figured out who I wanted to sell my practice to. I didn't leave it to chance. I didn't give it to some broker who is going to market it in some magazine or, you know, some other, you know, some other process that would, you know, throw out a wide net. That, that, that brings, that brings you all the bottom feeders too. I wanted to focus and he wanted to focus on people who could appreciate and afford the kind of services that he he was uh, he delivered. Now, obviously, I never saw your practice, but I did his. I mean, he had a grand piano in the in the waiting room. I mean, it was like beautiful. I mean, you walked in and you knew you were in a different place. So, the practice that I saw. So, I had a the building that I was in. So, in New York, it's a little bit different than Richmond, Virginia. Um, so the building that I was in was on 57th Street off Fifth Avenue. It was magnificent. Um, it was torn down. Um, but nobody walked into that building and thought that they were going to get a bargain. They walked into that building um, knowing that this was going to be a place of quality and substance. And when I sold my practice, I sold it to a, a group in on Park Avenue, um, right over right over Grand Central Station, um, a building that used to be called the Helmsley Building, um, that was built by the same by the same architect that um, that designed Grand Central Station. So you walk into that building and it is magnificent. Yeah, now that's that's interesting. Now, do you have when you coach and you consult with dentists around the country, mm-hmm. do you have them say, "Well, Michael, that's that was well and good for you in Manhattan, but you know, I live in Podunk, Idaho. Right. It doesn't work here. I can't. I don't have that level of class of people." What do you say to that kind of person? Well, I use I use Charlie Martin's example actually. Um, people flew all over the all over the country from all over the country to Richmond Virginia not necessarily known as the world's best place to get dental care but Charlie did great marketing and people came so i think one of the challenges that some that many dentists face is that they have this limited mindset that limits their um marketing if you would only to the 10, 15 miles around their office. Well, I mean, if that's the kind of dentistry that they do, that's fine. But, you know, I think both of us know somebody in Podunk, Indiana, who has a great practice, who does what what we call all on four, which are these big implant cases, um, and people come from all over the world, all over the country to go to this little town in Crown Point, Indiana, to get their care because Len, who's also a private client of Dan's, has marketed effectively 
so that people travel. People will travel to get to, I mean, I've seen people travel to Turkey to get hair implants. If people can go to Turkey to get hair implants or travel to Mexico or Colombia to get breast implants, people will travel to get what they think is the best value possible. Okay, so let's so most dentists, if they do any marketing at all, probably what they do is put an ad in some sort of magazine flyer, whatever. Right. In your world, that's really not marketing. So you talked about this Len up in Crown Point. What does he do differently? So he has a magazine. He has a newsletter. He runs seminars. He does untraditional marketing. It's all marketing. But he also, once he gets a patient in, he tries to stimulate interest in that patient helping the practice by helping their network. So he gets a lot of referrals from his existing patients, which is exactly similar to what what Charlie did in, in Richmond. Yeah, I'm looking at a book right now that I did for Charlie. It's it's hanging on my wall in my office. Forty nine reasons why our patients love Richmond Smile Center. <laughs> and and it's simply a testimonial book. So he gave me all the testimonials. I just put them in. I use different fonts in each, so it was different, and they have pictures before and after. That's it. And you put it, you put it in the, the front desk when they come in, and, oh, by the way, did you get Charlie's new book? <laughs> so, yeah. So that, but, that's um, a perfect. That's a perfect. So I, I, I apologize. I, you know, I forgot all no. about that. Everyone needs a book. Yeah. Everyone needs a book. So Charlie prompted me to write a book in 2010. It was called What the Tooth Fairy Didn't Tell You. <laughs> and I wrote it with Charlie because I wanted to educate my patients and for them to understand how what goes on in dental offices are not necessarily the same. And... I don't know if you remember, there was a company called Sims. It was a, it was a, a discount um, clothing uh, store. And their motto was, an educated consumer is our best customer. And I thought that was brilliant. And I believe that. I believe that an educated patient is a great patient. And there's... And, So I have this conversation all the time, and this is so important, Nina, Nina, because the books serve multiple purposes. Not only marketing, but it also makes the time spent with a patient more effective. When someone goes into a dental office, they're scared. And probably less than 20% of what is said verbally in the office gets actually heard by the patient. So we see complaints all the time from dentists and their teams that, you know, patient didn't do what I asked them to do. And chances are they didn't really hear what they were being, what you asked them because they're thinking about how quickly can I get the hell out of here? That's what they're thinking when they're in. How quickly can I get out? So having a booklet of instructions, having a book that discusses what you want your patient to know is so valuable on so many different levels. Yeah, I wrote years ago, I wrote two books for dentists. One is Your Smile Matters, and it's very much what you were talking about a minute ago talking about things and the same I've got clients and I license that content we customize it just for them 
um, but I've got them that they've bought hundreds and hundreds of those books because you're right. They can go and they can remember what they had to say. The second one, and this one is even more important, is what every person needs to know about dental implants. <laughs> so several years ago, my mother, uh, who was in her 80s at the time, um, needed some, she wanted dental implants, a couple dental implants. She goes to her regular dentist, and she says, and who does not do them, and she says, who should I use? The dentist says, I don't know. But here's three names. I don't know if they're any good, but I haven't heard anything bad. What if somebody who specializes in dental implants had provided that particular dentist with a, a stack of these books, and you could say, here's three names. Now, this guy wrote the book on dental implants. He's provided some copies for me to pass out. Here's a copy. Do you think there could be any chance that she might have picked that person? Brilliant. Brilliant. And, so, and that's exactly what, and that's exactly what Len did in Crown Point, Indiana. So he runs a, an education program for dentists about implants. He sets himself up as the expert that he is, but he doesn't want the easy implants. He wants the dentists who are there to do the easy ones. But as soon as there's a complicated one, he wants them to send them to him. And they do. Yeah, that's amazing. We, I'm looking at the time. We are almost done and out of time. But tell me another, I mean, I'm looking for everything you've done, but was there any other unconventional marketing that you did do in your practice or that you see others do? So I opened a satellite office in New Jersey because I live in New Jersey and we happen to have owned a building that had a vacant space, I said, mm, you know what, let me put an office, a dental office in there. So, so um, I used the, um, I used sort of a, a combination of direct mail and seminar marketing. So what I would do is I, I sent out uh, I've used every day, every, every door direct mail piece. I put a flyer in, um, in Sunday, Sunday um, newspapers, and I posted flyers in several senior centers, driving traffic to a landing page that promoted a seminar that was held in my office. I did two of those seminars a month. I would get between 10 and 20 people at each seminar. And I had an 80% close rate. What was the seminar about? Implants? So, this, so, so no, so it wasn't on, if it were implants, I probably would have gotten even more, but I, while I, while I had someone in my office in Manhattan who did implants, I did not have that luxury in New Jersey yet. So I focused on whole body, had the relationship of your mouth to chronic diseases in the rest of your body. That's interesting. Yeah, it goes back to what you were saying with Dan, um, dentistry for diabetics. Correct. So that was my focus. I ran a hospital dental program. I've been involved with organizations that promote what we call oral systemic health. Um, that was the sort of focus of my practice. Um, and that those were the seminars. And people, you know, if you can show somebody how they can, you know, reduce um, the likelihood of them getting heart disease, diabetes, cancers, and Alzheimer's by taking better care of their mouth, you're going to get people interested. Oh, and what I did, oh, I forgot the most important thing, Nina. I 
had an advertising piece in a giveaway magazine that was put in Whole Foods and vitamin stores. So, and that's probably, so I, the, every, the uh, every door direct mail did not get the results. I, we tested it, of course, um, did not get the results that we wanted. Um, the news, the flyer in the news uh, paper wasn't great. The best, the best um, return on investment were the flyers that I put in the senior centers and in churches and the advertising that I, that I, it was a full page ad in this magazine called natural awakenings, which basically targeted people who were interested in good health. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Well, and, and the key to what you just said is you tested it. You really didn't know until you tested all of them what was going to work and what wasn't going to work. <laughs> well, you know, that's, again, that's something I learned from Dan. Um, you know, without data, it's only an opinion. Yeah. So w- one last question. Are you seeing more and more dentists say, I've got to do something different, or are they just always still – you know, doing the same thing they always did and wondering why they're not getting different results. Yeah. So, you know, I do think that the pandemic has been an amplifier and an accelerator and people that had problems now have bigger problems. Um, And so dentists are more motivated to act um, and they don't know how to act. Um, So they get taken advantage of. And I hate that. I mean, I know how difficult it is for someone to become a dentist. I know how difficult it is to build a practice. And to see those people get taken advantage of just breaks my heart. So, well, but, it, but it's also going to be a mindset switch. They have to go out looking that something's got to change. I've got to find the person who's got the answer. So, and, and that's one of the reasons that I do these kinds of things. Um, you know, I, I don't have a lot of capacity um, from, cause my private consulting is pretty intensive. Um, and it, so it's very time consuming for me and I don't have a huge capacity, but if I can get the word out to people that they need to educate themselves um, prior to buying Whatever product it is uh, that will help that will help them in their office, I think I've done a great service. So you know, promoting good people like yourself who can offer proven solutions to the problems that they now know they have. If I can do that, I've had a good day. Yeah, no, that's that's terrific. You know what, Michael, we are at the end, but I have a feeling there's going to be some people out there who say, i got to find this guy. How can they get a hold of you, and do you have any special offer for them? So I do. Thank you. I have um, a company called Practice Perfect Systems, and it's practiceperfectsystems at gmail.com will get to me. Um, and the offer for anyone who's listening to this is I will give you three months free access to my Coffee with the Coach program, which has a huge amount of resources that can help anyone in certainly dental practice. It could, it, it, it could be translated to any business, but it's specific for dental practices. Well, that's a very generous offer. I appreciate it. So, Michael, thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, you will have helped a lot of people, I'm sure. And as as I'm sure you will, Nina, and it's great to reconnect. I agree. So tell Charlie hello for me. I'd love to touch base with him again. I Until just next to him on Sunday. <laughs> oh, good. 
So until next time, this is Nina Hershberger saying go out and make it a great day. Thank you for listening to Megabucks Radio with Nina Hirschberger. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or to listen to past episodes, visit megabucksradio.com.